pan-generational, pan-geographical, pan-economic, pan-gender group, they demonstrate explicitly that sharing knows no boundaries. Generation share, rather than a demographic, is a mindset, a lifestyle that we can choose to adopt. Hello, and welcome to Promote the Hell Out of It. My name is Ms. Trujillo, and this is the podcast where I talk to people worth promoting about subjects we should all be talking about. And this is an episode that is really important to my personal journey. I talk to Benita Madowska, a world-leading speaker and changemaker, a global sharing economy expert, the author of Generation Share, a book which was published in June last year and contains the world's first collection of inspiring stories by the changemakers who are building this sharing economy we're going to be talking about. She's also the founder of The People Who Share, a charity and social enterprise that helps people discover the power of the sharing economy. Now, if you've listened to any of the previous episodes, you know this is a subject which is important for me. I've been traveling the UK for a while now with the help of a company called Trusted House Sitters, who actually sponsored Generation Share, the book that Benita published. But I've also had guests on the podcast and we've covered this subject in, in some detail. We've talked to Kelly Kemp about cooperatives and about what's going on in Kurdistan in Rojava. She's involved with, with the Kurdish Solidarity Portsmouth campaign. I've also talked about future thinking with, with Jonathan Emma and I've talked to, to Elena Snare about sustainability. So this is a subject that, that keeps on coming up and I was extremely excited to talk to Benita about the real potential sharing economy has to change the world what it actually is, and to debunk a load of the myths that come up around the subject. So I really do hope you enjoy this episode. Now, this is a pan-generational, pan-geographical, pan-economic, pan-gender group. They demonstrate explicitly that sharing knows no boundaries. Generation share, rather than a demographic, is a mindset, a lifestyle that we can choose to adopt. Hurrah. It's recording. Excellent. <laughs> so how are you? I'm good. I'm really good, actually. It's been an incredible summer, launching Generation Share and yeah. gearing up. I'm going to Wales next week and then um, US um, oh, wow. the following week. So, yeah, it's all getting quite busy. That sounds absolutely great. No, it's good to be busy. I think it's, it's a good place to start just with your explanation of what sharing economy actually means, because there's a lot of misconceptions. There are a lot of misconceptions about what the sharing economy is, and I define it really simply. It's a system to live by. It's where we care for people and planet, and we share available resources in any way that we can. So it's quite a broad definition, but essentially the sharing economy really is, is very broad spectrum. Um, I define it, if we want to get into the technicalities of it, I define it as the sort of five parts of the sharing economy. So there's what we're sharing, um, you know, that could be tangible things or intangible things. So it could be things like goods and food and transport and skills. But it's also things like time and power and knowledge and responsibility and creativity. And then we've got the subsets of the sharing economy, which are crowdsourcing, social enterprise, volunteering, fair trade, even vintage. So all of these things are actually aspects of the sharing economy. And then we've got the mode, which is how the sharing happens in practice. So whether we're swapping, renting, borrowing, lending, exchanging, but it's also collaborating and peer to peer uh, and repairing and recycling. Those are also forms of sharing. And then you've got the characteristics and values that underpin the sharing economy. And that's everything from sustainability, it's transparency, it's inclusive, it's positive, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure. It's circular and it's fair and it's also compassionate. And then finally, we've got impact, and that's why we share. So it's all about the social impact that's created, whether that's poverty reduction, whether that's social inclusion, social mobility, protecting the environment, equality, community, well-being, happiness and health. So that's really gives you the kind of the overarching sense. But it's been, it's been, the sharing economy has been sort of wildly misrepresented in many ways. And what we've been given is a very narrow view and perspective on the sharing economy. And, you know, most people have, you know, have heard of lots of these companies like Airbnb and, you know, but the sharing economy is not really defined or represented by these companies because sharing is, is something that makes us human. But overall, I just say it's a system to live by where we care for people and planet and we share available resources in any way that we can. And we're all part of it. We can all be part of it because to share is to be human. It's so true. And it's something that we get taught as kids to, to share and, 
and it's something that gets gets drawn so much into education but that kind of gets forgotten as we get older and it all becomes about about work and and how much money we can earn and it's interesting that as adults we need reminding of how important sharing is more than ever before really well exactly and in fact i did a whole ted talk quite a few years ago at tedx brighton which was exactly about this point the fact that we need to relearn to share because you're absolutely right, as kids, you know, we do learn to share and you always hear parents saying to their kids, you know, you've got to share, you've got to share. And we do learn that. So, you know, one of the first lessons probably that we learn. And, and, and again, as adults, we, you know, we start to forget that. But I think what's, what I'm seeing is happening around the world. And the thing that I'm really excited about at the moment is that there is a big shift happening. There's, you know, consciousness is being raised. We've got huge pressing issues like climate change that are, you know, the science is absolutely irrefutable. And we know that we ultimately, we, we have to share. You know, our, our planetary resources may be finite, but our potential to share is unlimited. And so my work is all about how we can unleash that. And the reason why I set off on this journey to create Generation Share uh, it's a book that was published this summer. It's sustainably produced from waste materials and it's uh, with a non-profit publisher, Policy Press, who published books about social change. And it's basically the largest showcase of positive stories of change makers from around the world. So I've interviewed over 200 change makers. I've worked in collaboration with photographer with purpose, Sophie Scheinwald, who just, I mean, it's an extraordinary visual book. Um, bringing these stories to life and it just really demonstrates that you know change is happening all over the world and there are change makers everywhere who are doing all kinds of incredible things in their in their you know in their communities in their homes in their businesses and and you know change is happening everywhere but what we need to be doing is we need to bring these stories to public attention because we need to share the positive if we want to change the world we've got to change the narrative of course, of course. And I think that when you talk about sharing economy, a lot of people who haven't got a clue about what it stands for automatically think about a lot of the political examples we've got of, of sharing in an economy and as, as a country maybe being done by corrupt individuals in a very corrupt way. So we haven't really got the best, the best guideline for seeing how in history it had been done. Well, it's, it's interesting because for every person that I interviewed for the book, I asked them a really simple question, which is what does sharing mean to you? And the answers to those questions, that question was, you know, was incredibly varied. And so, you know, depending on where people are in the world and their, you know, perceptions, you know, it change, changes massively. And I'm just going to actually read a, you know, a quote to you. And it just gives an idea of the sort of variety of what sharing means to different people. So this is a mother who believes that her baby's life was saved due to the sharing of human milk through a human milk bank that is saving the lives of premature babies. And she says, you have to imagine you're in an ICU unit your child is in an incubator. There are tubes and cables everywhere and he can't even breathe by himself. Knowing that my baby could be fed by donor milk was the moment I thought I'm so thankful that somebody took the time to share their milk. It came through a chain of people who are willing to share. We need to get back to that and not be so engrossed in our own lives. All women who are able to share their milk are heroes to me. And it just starts to give you an idea of you know, the capacity and the human capacity to share. This is what the sharing economy is. The sharing economy is made up of all of us who share on a daily basis in lots of different ways. But what we need to be doing is we need to be accessing all of these shared resources and promoting this positively as a way of life. Another example that I'm going to give you from Generation Share is a disabled man in a wheelchair. And when I asked him, He's the founder of an organization called 1000 for 1000. And what they do is they crowdfund rent for refugees, for people who, have, who don't have them, who've been through the most traumatic experiences and arrive in this country and after horrific journeys and have nowhere to live. And what he's doing is he's crowdsourcing that rent for those refugees and finding them, finding them somewhere to live That's and some amazing. shelter. And when I asked him, what does sharing mean to you? This is what he had to say. He said, one thing that's nice about being disabled is that it makes you aware of your own dependence on other people. 
I can't get dressed, go to the toilet or eat without assistance. Of course, no one else can either, right? We invisibilize the sewage worker. We invisibilize the people who make the clothes. They are somewhere else, but your dependence on them is enormous. Sharing is just very visible when you're disabled. And that's Jacob Berkson, who's the founder of Thousand for One Thousand. You know, sharing means many things to many people. And, and this is what we need to be promoting and, and, and providing more access to and understanding so that people know they're all part of this. We're all part of the sharing economy. It's something that's inherent. It's in each of us. And, and you know, that's really what, what I'm seeking to do with this book is, is to elevate these stories. Because, you know, he, you listen to the news, for example, and you would be forgiven for thinking that, you know, the world is a horrific place. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, when you start traveling and specifically, you, you know, you, you only find things when you go looking for them, right? And I went to look for Generation Share. I wanted to find the brave and positive, the change makers, because I wanted to document how these change makers are saving and changing lives and actually to evidence the power of sharing to change the world. And so I intentionally sought out positive stories, these stories of hope, because Positivity is a really important characteristic of the sharing economy. It, it provides this antidote to the disease of cynicism and negativity that I believe is destroying our world. And it's actually positivity is the language of this new economy because it offers people healing and hope and inspiration, which is so needed at this time because, you know, we're seeing that hate and totalitarianism and populism are unfortunately winning votes. And I believe we've got a crisis of, of responsible leadership and to tackle our complex problems, we need these solution-focused, socially conscious, but above all, positive leaders, change makers. And so, you know, by elevating this status of positivity, of good and consciousness, I believe we can change the world. We've got to change the narrative in order to change the world. That's so true. And I think it's such an important, important part of the conversation. I, I got introduced to, to economy sharing through Zipcar when I was working in London. Um, and it was great to start off with because it meant that I could access a car for work in a city that otherwise I'd be unable to, to afford a car. But part of what I, I loved that you were talking about is the effect this has on people that, that need sharing in order to have access to these things. That puts a lot of pressure on companies to actually do things in an ethical way that is that is rewarding not people that already have access to these things and just making it easier for them, but for everyone. How, how is that accomplished? How do we make sure that sharing economy doesn't just become a thing for, for the rich, for the privileged to share what they have? Well, it's really interesting because, you know, one of the, one of the findings of this book is that actually sharing economy isn't um, a middle class thing. It, you know, it, it spans all generations. Actually, the, the book itself is an exploration of demographics because I wanted to better understand who are the people who are behind and you know, who are building the sharing economy. You know, are they young? Are they old? Um, you know, are they, are they men? Are they women? Are they rich? Are they poor? You know, are they from particular religions? Are they able-bodied? Are they disabled? Are they from particular cultures? Do they live in particular, do they live in cities or villages? You know, is this about urban and rural environments? Yeah. Is this about, you know, uh, you know, where you are geographically in the world? And actually, you know, the findings of the book are really clear that this, it really is pan-generational. It does span, um, you know, multi-generations. Um, you know, I actually say in the, in the conclusion to the book, you know, this is a pan-generational, pan-geographical, pan-economic, pan-gender group. They demonstrate explicitly that sharing knows no boundaries. Generation share rather than a demographic is a mindset, a lifestyle that we can choose to adopt. It represents a new consciousness that's emerging, an awareness that consumption doesn't lead to happiness or well-being, but that through sharing and caring for people and planet and harnessing the power of technology for good, we can create a more equal, human, ha happy, healthy, resource-efficient, connected and sustainable economy. You know, sharing's everywhere if we look for it. It's in our homes, it's in our communities, it's our schools, our businesses, our cities, our villages, and it's in, within each of us in a limited supply. Because sharing's not an age thing, or a gender thing, or a culture thing. It's a human thing. And, you know, this book is showing that to share is, is to be human. So, you know, far from this notion of, 
this is something only for the wealthy. It really is for everybody. And, you know, one of the incredible things that happened was, so the book is crowdfunded. The, the, the travel for the book was crowdfunded. And the day after Sophie and I finished our, our Kickstarter campaign to raise funds so that we could actually travel and go and meet these extraordinary change makers, I received this uh, message on LinkedIn. And this is just extraordinary, so I'm going to read it to you. February the 26th, 2017. Dear Benita, I hope my voice will reach you. My name is Artie Naik. I'm a slum-based young girl change maker. I run Saki for Girls Education, a slum school for girls in Mumbai, India. We share knowledge and the chance of a positive future for girls. I would like to be part of your project because I am Generation Share. I strongly believe that because of you and your initiative, my slum-based girls' voices will reach globally. I hope for the best, Artie Nake. Now, the fact that a girl 5,000 miles away from where I live in Brighton had actually heard about Generation Share and had, had contacted me via LinkedIn because she believed that this could help her and her slum-based girls have hope and have a future, that to me told me that you know, this idea of putting this book together and reaching out and connecting these change makers and showcasing their stories wasn't so crazy after all. And through and through the book, you know, we've seen lots of examples of people living, you know, in all kinds of challenging situations. Um, you know, slums in India, we were in, uh, in, in Greece, um, you know, talking to people who, um, a doctor, for example, who set up a network of clinics to serve the needs of people who cannot get access to healthcare, because the Greek government in their, in their wisdom decided that, you know, a few years ago that if you've been unemployed for longer than a year, you no longer had access to healthcare. Well, that's a, a large percentage of the population and certainly all of the refugees. And as you know, there's been a huge refugee crisis in Greece and the flow of refugees through the country is, is immense. And so, you know, this meant that people did not have access to any kind of medical care and a doctor who, you know, recognized the need to provide healthcare to everybody. This is why she went into the profession. She set up this network, Dr. Olga Kasidu. She's extraordinary. She connected with 14 other um, medical professionals and they have these solidarity clinics that are often in unused abandoned buildings um, and they're using surplus medicines that would otherwise go to landfill. And not only are they serving those the needs in there and they're actually providing um you know uh, they're providing that medical service to people who who need that but they're also providing um uh, you know they have a collective of you know meals and and they have uh, you know clothing drives and they're creating these community kitchens and so actually these places become these centers for communities to connect with each other and so, you know, it's extraordinary wherever people are on the economic scale, wherever they are, you know, in the world, actually these things are happening and they're out there. We just need to be telling these stories and bringing them to public attention because people don't know about half of the things, most of the things that are happening around the world that are positive. Absolutely. And, and that's why I asked because you gave exactly the, the answer I was hoping for, that it is for everyone and it makes the conversation so much more important when you know it can make real change. And along those lines, I wanted to touch on, on the effect it could have on resources, because it's a conversation that, that goes around a lot. And I think a lot of people view it as if there's not enough resources to go around. And that's why people are suffering. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting is the fact that you know, we know from our, from our own research, I run a charity called The People Who Share. And we know from our own research that there are over 3.5 trillion pounds worth of idle resources in the world. And that's everything from homes, you know, shelter to food, um, to all kinds of clothing. And, you know, yet we also know that, you know, 40,000 people die every day because they don't have access to the basic necessities. And yeah. so the reality, of course, is that we you know, we need to be sharing, we need to be sharing these resources. I mean, just to give you some really specific examples from our own research, we know that, you know, by sharing the 1.3 billion tons of food, that's a third of food is currently wasted each year. 
we could feed the 10 billion people worldwide that are living in food poverty. We have everything that we need to yeah. solve these problems. That An we abundance, have. yeah. Through resource sharing, it exists. You know, in the UK alone, for example, um, you know, there are 650 million meals worth of food that go to landfill every year. There's three times the amount that we need to feed the eight um, 0.2 million people that are living in food poverty in the UK. So this is the issue. The issue is that we have the resources. What we need to be doing is we need to be sharing those resources. And you know there are some incredible change makers that are that are doing just that. You know we've got lots of share, food sharing apps like Olio. I don't know if you've ever used it, but I it's quite heard. extraordinary. Brilliant. You know download it. Free download. Yeah. And basically it pops up and it tells you that you know there's someone in your neighbourhood that you know has listed some food that you know they can't use and other than that why would why should that go to waste you know we've got a third of food being wasted globally it's it's an abomination yeah um, and actually you can go and collect that food you, you get to meet neighbors you get to meet people and you get access to you know to food there are people who are living in food poverty who are accessing food through olio and that's helping them to you know feed their families and they're accessing that for free and that is a resource that would otherwise be wasted but equally, you know, people are using Olio and they're connecting, making social bonds in their communities. So, you know, it's it really is extraordinary how the impact that the sharing can have. I mentioned earlier about human milk banks. We know that human milk banks could prevent 2.1 million deaths a year um, by the, through the sharing of human milk. So, you know, there are so many. We have we have 10 times the amount of, of housing um, that we that we that we do that we need. Tell me you about know. it. I was homeless in London for a while and uh, I used to look at all these empty houses and just it, it makes you so mad to think that so many people need shelter and that there's so many resources around us that just go to waste sometimes. Exactly. I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, using Zipcar, for example. So, you know, we don't own a car here and, you know, we access a, a car club, um, you know, in Brighton, that's Enterprise Car Club. And, and, you know, it makes sense. We know that, for example, through sharing cars, we could save 4.2 million premature, de premature deaths a year from the associated air pollution that are created by cars. So, so actually, you know, we're talking about life-saving here. This is not just about, you know, someone actually, um, Savan Muazan, who's a, a phenomenal entrepreneur um, who runs a, a social enterprise called Agunte, which is all about empowering women social entrepreneurs. Um, she says, you know, that sharing isn't a fluffy thing. And it's not a fluffy thing. There's nothing fluffy about sharing. You know, sharing is something that is, it's empowering, it's inspiring, it's needed, it's life-saving, it's certainly life-changing. And I think when we start to look at sharing in that context, we start to realize the, 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 the social impact that, you know, that sharing is having and, and can have. So true. And the knock-on effects it can have. In, when we traveled Asia, we were in Malaysia for quite a while, and, and Grab, which is the equivalent of Uber, is used there a lot. Uh, and the amount of, of, for example, Muslim women we'd see who were drivers, it was equal to the amount of men that that drove us around and that's something that would have not happened in that country a few years ago and is accessible through through exactly this. and it's also you know that service in particular and you see across asia i was in indonesia i'm doing a piece of work um i'm presenting so i do a lot of um I'm a, I'm a speaker i'm an international speaker and i was talking about you know what's happening in Indonesia specifically in terms of the sharing economy. And what you start to find is that a number of these sharing apps and, uh, you know, bike sharing apps, for example, that are specifically, you know, run by and targeted at women and also their children. It's enabling their children to get to school, to have an education, to get to their healthcare appointments. I mean, there's all kinds of, of impacts that those kind of sharing initiatives are having on, on families and, you know, certainly in terms of, of you know, of women empowerment. We've got a really lovely story of, of a woman who um, has started these uh, meals in, she lives in Jaffa in Israel, you know, and she, she talks about how empowered she feels, um, you know, growing up in her Arab community, uh, you know, having people come into her home and actually you know she is creating these meals she'd always you know she she always had a passion for food um but when when your role is essentially 
providing food 24 seven for your family and it's a kind of thankless task, but then you have people coming into your home that are paying for a meal and all they have to say is, you know, how incredible that meal is and can they get the recipes and they want to know the stories behind the food. And this has given this woman a whole kind of career. You know, she's now, um, you know, she's now been on television and she's, you know, she's really respected as a, as a, as a chef and, you know, it's completely changed her life. That's through the, the um, Israeli platform Eat With, um, which is, a, is now a, a, global, a global platform. It's kind of like a, a sort of Airbnb for, you know, for food. Um, and, you know, and we see all kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned to you that um, trusted house sitters are the sponsors of, of Generation Share. You know, yeah. to make something like this from waste materials, it's expensive to produce. Um, we're working with Policy Press, but we needed to raise some some sponsorship for it, and we wanted to find a sponsor that shared the values, that had those kind of ethical values of the sharing economy, and that truly believed um, with a passion um, how sharing could change the world. And I love trusted house sitters because you know they're they're all about caring for the planet and for the animals that that live on the planet. And and I know that you're also a, a pet lover too. I'm 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 I'm, I'm here talking to you and, and my rescue dog, Buster, who's 13 years old and going blind and deaf. Oh. Um, you know, he's curled up fast asleep with his little bandana. I'm um, looking very cute. And, um, but, you know, again, it's, it's uh, trusted house sitters provide a way to connect with a, a whole global community of pet lovers and travel yeah. the world, as you know from personal experience. So I think there's so many different ways in which people can intersect and interact with the sharing economy that they may not know about. And really Generation Share is, and my work is all about bringing that to life and light and public attention. It's so true. And there's a couple of things I want to touch on based on what, what you've said. Um, and, and the first is a lot of the things we've, we've talked about are, are visible, the effects it's got, the resources, the jobs it creates. Um, but what about things that aren't so visible, like the well-being that it brings to people? That's why we teach kids to be generous, right? Because it makes you happier. Well, it's, it's really interesting because we know, again, from research that the more you share, the happier you become. Um, the people that are, are sharing and, uh, and have a, a more, uh, particularly who share a positive outlook, um, you know, are 80% more likely to, be, to have better health, for example. Um, and well-being um, but there's a really interesting piece of research which I do touch upon in, gen in Generation Share book um, which took place in Frome and you know this is very robust critical, credible medical research and, and, and really the idea was to look at the impact of introducing sharing projects on people who are incredibly isolated particularly the elderly and what this piece of research found was that um, there is a connection between um, isolation and loneliness and chronic pain and inflammatory diseases like for example arthritis and by introducing these sharing projects um, everything from uh, sharing hubs places where people were brought to connect and have a meal and share a meal um, buddying programs um, by introducing these projects um, what they found over a, over a period of time was that the, the rate at which people, particularly elderly people, were presenting at A&E was dramatically reduced um, and that there was a, a direct correlation between the reduction of inflammation and the reduction of chronic pain through these sharing projects. That if you are, the more social connections you have, the more sharing you do, um, this has a positive impact and a direct impact on pain and health and well-being. And of course, you know, there's a whole range of psychological uh, mental health issues that go along with this as well. And of course, again, we know mental health is so improved by having greater number of connections and, and through you know, sharing and, and having um, those kind of social connections, social bonds. So there are all sorts of implications, you know, sharing impacts every aspect of our lives and and that's the reason why you know what we need to be doing is we need to be elevating the status of sharing um, you know so that this is something that is is really seen as very desirable in society but also that you know we give light to those untold stories of of ordinary people who are doing incredible extraordinary things through sharing exactly and i think it's it's 
really interesting because a lot of what we've talked about some people will be instantly drawn to because they know instinctively that we will do better together as a society but especially in the west we come from a society where we've been taught to be quite selfish so something like well-being can speak to people who maybe are drawn to to the more selfish side of things and slowly convince them to get interested in the conversation and something i wanted to touch on in regards to this is a myth that maybe alienates some people from researching this further and it's a myth that a sharing economy means you're giving something away for free can we debunk that a bit yeah we can definitely debunk that well i would say that, that you know there are a few myths to be debunked here so first of all you know the term sharing you know what does that really mean and you know in a sharing economy there are so many different aspects of sharing different types of sharing we all share in different ways and this sort of idea that some sharing is good and some sharing is not so good you know actually the, the the broader definition of the sharing economy encompasses a whole range of things so for example you know we talk about things like um uh, you know, why is renting sharing? You know, this is something that, that I hear often and it's a question that's often asked. Well, when you're renting something, for example, with your, your Zipcar example, you are accessing a shared resource. And what that means is that, you know, there's a huge amount of um, carbon reduction that happens in that, but you're also connecting with other people. There's all of the resources that went into creating that resource in the, in the first place, that if you were owning that car, for example, in this case, um, then, you know, there would be huge amounts of kind of redundancy. The average car sits and used for 23 hours and 15 minutes a day. So, so first of all, you know, there's, there are all these myths around, you know, what is the sharing in the sharing economy? Sharing doesn't necessarily mean that it is free. You know, we might pay for something, but we're accessing a shared resource. I might buy, um, you know, a vintage dress, but I'm accessing a pre-loved item i'm accessing a resource that already existed without having to all the damage that goes into you know you know new production and particularly you know in the fashion industry we know that you know there's huge amounts of devastation that occurs um, just to make a single t-shirt so you know i think what's important it, you know is to understand the different types of sharing and, and, and how i define you know there's different forms of value exchange in the sharing economy You've got social value, you've got economic value, and you've got environmental value. So, you know, for example, if if you know if you and I are, um, let's say we're you know we're, we're exchanging skills. Um, so, for example, I um, I come and I, I I cook a meal for you or something, or yeah. you know, we we you know bring out some recipes and we do a whole kind of culinary you know exploration or something and then in exchange for that maybe you help me with some technology or something and you know but there's a value exchange that's happening there no money may have exchanged hands as we know it but there's certainly a value exchange and so you know i think this whole idea of what does sharing mean um, is actually really important and you know people ask often okay well what's the difference between giving and sharing and in many ways, I consider sharing to be sustainable giving. Sharing is very much two-way. It's, it's two-way. I would also argue that when you're giving, it's, it's always two-way. Because, for example, you know, if you, um, in the case of people who may support RT Naik's slum-based school, and they may give something to help um, with that school, they, might, they may give some books, for example. But what they're getting in return is a connection um, to, you know, to that school. They're learning so much about that project, about how, how education works in, you know, in the slums in India, for example. Or it might be that, you know, that feel-good factor, that connection. But very, very often when you talk to people about charitable giving, actually they're, they're doing this or volunteering is another example. People are doing this because they want to connect with other people. They want connection. Um, and, and very often what you find is the volunteers are actually getting more out of the, the, the situation in many ways because they want that human connection and to be part of a community. Um, so I, I think we need to, we need to sort of under, better understand that, you know, it's, it, this is not about a one-way street. This is very much about, you know, what comes back. There's a really interesting story in the Netherlands 
um, someone called Cohn um, van der Steeg, who set up We Help Him. He has an extraordinary story. So he was basically, um, he worked in, in technology and he had a horrific motorcycle accident and he woke up in intensive care basically with an acquired brain injury. Oh, wow. And through this process of recuperation, there was a point when um, the doctors had pretty much written off his future, um, but they told him to go and take walks, that that would help being out in nature, that would help with the, the kind of repair of his brain. And, you know, he got to thinking, well, I can physically, he could do everything that needed to be done. You know, he's like, I could go and get someone shopping for them. I could... He thought about all the help that he could offer other people with the time that he had available. And, and then he, he started thinking, well, you know, and there's obviously times when he's needed help, um, you know, in the first few months of, of, his, you know, of his accident, for example, his wife, you know, they had a toddler and a newborn baby and his wife had a wow. nervous breakdown because, you know, yeah, it's I'm not surprised. possible to, to cope with the situation. And so the point is, you know, everybody needs help at some point in their lives. This is a two-way street. And so what he, he did was he set up this platform, We Help Him, based on this idea that we all need help. And so people can connect and help each other. And the example in the book, which was just an extraordinary day, actually, that we spent with these women, was a woman um, called Tinica. She, um, her children had grown up. Um, they didn't really need her anymore. She was feeling quite lonely. She wanted to connect with people in her community. She wanted to feel valued. Um, who doesn't? But she really wants to feel valued. And so she wanted to volunteer and get connected to community. She was feeling quite lonely and isolated and undervalued. And, you know, then there was Astrid. And Astrid has um, a child with special needs and an elderly mother um, who always likes to be known as Mrs. Koch. Um, she's no longer with us anymore, but an, an extraordinary woman. And Astrid needed help because she didn't live, she had to live near the special needs school. She couldn't live near to her mother and she needed help with, for someone to visit um, her elderly mother of in course, her own yeah. home so she could be safe and she wasn't, you know, having falls and, and all those sorts of things. And so through We Help Home, um, these three women connected it's quite extraordinary. And the relationship that was built between um, Tinica, who's a volunteer, and, and Mrs. Koch, you know, who described her as a, as a second daughter, um, was extraordinary. And that enabled, enabled Mrs. Koch to stay in her home for longer. We, we need to start thinking about the kind of impacts on our, you know, look at the healthcare system and, and you know, social care, and we have an aging population. And sharing really is a solution to so many of these problems. And there you know, were people connected. We've already talked about, you know, they're likely to have, you know, less chronic pain. They're likely to be happier and healthier. They're likely to live longer. They're also likely to be able to stay longer in their homes because that they have that human connection. So there's all kinds of benefits. And then, of course, there's a financial benefit to, to all of that. You just think about the, the strain on the NHS in the UK and, you know, in, in other countries. And, you know, in the Netherlands now, um, the major healthcare providers are all working with We Helpen. So this, this, this We Helpen, you know, service is promoted through the equivalent of the NHS in the Netherlands because it's, you know, it's very, very credible and, and it's having huge kind of impact. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you mentioned sustainability. And for me, sharing economy is so important in keeping future proving what comes next so in 30 years time the effects that the sharing economy could have on all our lives is incredible but with this in mind how should this impact decision making you mentioned rent beforehand why would you say it's a good idea to not push prices up and let greediness overtake what's the benefit for for, for example the homeowner to actually consider the sustainability and the future proofing? So I, I think that what's important, I'm gonna talk about cities a little bit to answer that question, because I think what you're referring to is, the, is some of the challenges around, you know, particularly Airbnb um, in cities where, you know, residents um, are feeling that, you know, prices are, are, are going up in their neighborhood. Yeah, that's a great example. They're, they're being priced out and some of those challenges that we've seen around regulation and that kind of regulation. 
And I think what's really important, and there's a good example again in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, of where they have brought together, Amsterdam is a sharing city, and they've brought together across the city all of the different players, all of the different stakeholders and uh, communities that um, have a vested interest, if you like, have an interest in the city. Um, they live in the city, um, they work in the city, and, and together they have formed this coalition and they have determined what works for Amsterdam. And so they put some regulation around, for example, Airbnb that basically says they're not banning it. They see that, that you know, there are positive benefits to this, that you know, one of the things that happens um, with Airbnb is that, that money is, is spread into the local economy. You know, people go and stay in areas that they previously wouldn't have visited otherwise. Um, people tend to travel more sustainably when they're staying in people's homes with more care. They tend to recycle more and they use less, fewer resources and they spend their money in the local area rather than, yeah. for example, with, you know, large, you know, corporate entities. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are economic benefits for local people, but at the same time, there are some challenges. And so what they did in Amsterdam was it was determined that, you know, 30 days a year was... Um, an amount of time that you know people could rent out their spare rooms or their properties and you know in other cases there have been restrictions around this whole idea of the number of properties that people can own so that it's not creating a business in a neighborhood where actually people need to live and are being priced out of their homes so i think there's all kinds of ways in which this can be fairly addressed but it needs to be addressed in the locations by the people who it affects the most and to determine what works for that particular city or, or town. Um, that is really important. Um, there's an organization uh, called the Sharing Cities Alliance. Um, again, it's born out of the Netherlands. It's also featured in the book. And this is the work that they do. And at the People Who Share, we've also done some work around you know, sharing cities and enabling cities to become um, more sustainable in that respect. So I think it, it's about what's appropriate and reasonable um, similarly with you know some of the other um, initiatives in the sharing economy some of the other big businesses again you know what we need to be doing is we need to be um, it needs to be proportionate um, it needs to be fair it needs to be proportionate it needs to be what's relevant and is important to the people who are most affected um, you know and and, and I, I, I believe that sharing economy companies also have a responsibility and we're seeing of, of, of social enterprises in the sharing economy space who really are dedicated to social impact and creating social impact and so you know we're seeing for example um, cooperative platforms emerging where you know the drivers own the platform they're the ones that are benefiting they're the ones delivering the service and they're the ones that are benefiting they own the companies um, you know, we're seeing the rise of, of, of B Corps, for example, benefit corps, where these companies have a responsibility to create social impact. And that financial and economic and commercial drivers um, cannot supersede that social impact. So, and, and this I see as really the next phase of the sharing economy, actually, is very much, um, you know, how these ideas can be apply to really positively impact society and that's really the aspect of the sharing economy that i'm interested in is the social impact and how we can positively benefit people and planet because that's really what's important and also you know time is not on our side and we we can't afford to not be sharing resources um, we we need to be doing that and all kinds of resources um, you know whether that's knowledge and ideas and insights um, power responsibilities opportunity and also the physical things that that you know that exist in the world um, we need to get on with solving these big global problems and as i say we've got all of the resources needed we can end world hunger it is possible to do that it's absolutely possible to do that you know people think that's impossible but it's not it's possible you know it's so true we've got yeah at least three times the amount of food than we actually need to solve that problem it's ridiculous and i was just having a bit of a giggle at how how annoyed donald trump would be if he was listening to this conversation <laughs> um because everything that he stands for is kind of opposite to what you've just said which absolutely. is kind of beautiful <laughs> absolutely it is the complete antithesis to that and I love that. <laughs> and that's why we need to be changing the narrative. 
you know, we need to change the narrative in this country. You know, we've got our Boris Johnson and, you know, and, 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 and we too here also need to be focusing on the positives, the solutions, rather than, you know, Brexit chaos and everything else yeah. that's going on at the moment. It's ridiculous. And it's replicated over and over. I'm, I'm Spanish and Spain's not, it isn't far behind either with how they're treating people in Barcelona. So it's, it's replicated too much. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's, but at the same time, you know, we need to be exactly what we're talking about here for this podcast is we need to be giving light and life to these positive stories, because again, we are swamped by the Trump stories and the negativity. Yeah. We're swamped by this. And actually, the majority of actions and activities that are happening in this world are actually positive, but you wouldn't believe it you know, when you, when you, when you listen to, you know, what's, what's getting the focus, what's being seen as a priority. And there's never been a better time to get involved. I mean, technology has made it easier than ever. Uh, we, we've got access to, to people, we can communicate so quickly. I've got a friend who's just set up actually a, a sharing platform called PackShare um, for packaging that people are basically chucking away another company's need. Fantastic, and he's putting I love them all, that. I it's absolutely great. I will send I will send you the details because uh, he's a wonderful individual. Please do. Well, introduce introduce me actually because I'm always interested to have these people on my on my radar. You know, I work as a global sharing economy expert. Always interested to have these people on my radar because again, you know, these are stories that we need to give life to, um, and give visibility to, um, and and it is only by doing that that we are going to make a difference. It's only by doing that that we're, you know, we're going to create that change that needs to happen in the world. Um, you know, by people hearing about these fantastic initiatives. Um, you know, the more that these, you know, that these apps are downloaded, that these projects are supported, that people, you know, know that, for example, I mean, have you heard about Beam? You know, which stands for no. amazing. So it's incredible. It's a crowdfunding platform for training and employment for homeless people. Amazing. Um, started by Alex Stephanie, um, uh, based in London. And, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. And what Alex is doing with Beam is, you know, he's giving um, a future for homeless people, tackling that huge problem of the vast numbers and increasing numbers of, of, of people that are living on the streets. And the intention, of course, is to, is to scale this globally. And I have no doubt that he'll do it. And, you know, how, how Beam works is that, you know, each of us um, that is able to can make a contribution of, you know, one pound, two pound, three pound, four pound, five pounds. And, and then what happens is, is that is shared amongst um, uh, the, the homeless people that are on the platform and the crowdfunding campaign um, that is run with, in, you know, in partnership with the, with, with the homeless people for training um, to give them a future. So in, in Generation Share, um, we feature someone called Guy who'd been living on the streets uh, for a very long time um, and was given his first drug by his, his dad at the age of 10. And... You know, he grew up in a community where nobody had any kind of employment and crime was everywhere. And of course, that was the life that was given to him. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, consequently, he's, you know, uh, been in and out of prison. And, you know, now through Beam, he has this amazing opportunity. Um, he's, um, he's completing training to be an electrician, um, you know, giving him the skills that he needs to have sustainable employment. That's so um, amazing. And, you know, and again, this is how this works. So a lot of these, um, you know, these incredible social entrepreneurs that are, are creating these change makers that are creating, and they're not, it's not just about platforms either. It's not just about technology. You know, there's all kinds of, of applications of, you know, communities that people are setting up, um, you know, with different, uh, you know, sustainable communities that again are providing all kinds of opportunities. Um, you know, there's a project in the US called D-Town Farm, um, Malik Yakatini, um, who again, extraordinary campaigner for food justice. And this is about, you know, local people um, being, he's part of the Black Detroit Network and, you know, being able to access affordable food for their community. Um, you know, and it's a farm, it's a cooperative. And again, you know, there are all kinds of, of projects on the ground. So it's not just about technology, all forms of sharing, but Again, we need to be giving light and life to these projects. It's so true. It's so true. And I've just been frantically writing down all the examples you've, you've given because I want to obviously check them out. Uh, they sound so incredible. I've got one last question for you. 
And it seems like an obvious one, but I, I quite sometimes like obvious questions. Uh, on an individual level, what should we personally be doing to spread the word? What can people who listen to the podcast do to get involved and, and make this a reality and make it work long term? So, you know, I mentioned earlier this whole idea that to share is to be human. So, you know, whether that's I mean, when I wake up on a morning, I ask myself, what can I share? That could be as simple as smiling at somebody in the street. You know, it could be something really simple. We have a laughter sharer in the book who is all about sharing laughter. So the sharing that happens on an individual basis can be something really simple. But it could also be something that's, you know, it could be volunteering time. It could be, um, you know, helping out a local food bank. It, it, you know, it could be participating in a clothes swap. It could be, you know, visiting someone that needs a visit. Go and make a cup of tea for somebody that's, you know, that's isolated. Go and say hello to somebody in your street that you don't know. Um, you know, these are things that everybody can do that are, are really simple. Think about your resource use. You know, think about the things that you own. Do you need to own them? Do you need to own them if you if you're not using them? Could someone else use them? You know, think about those things. But I, I do, I just, I run through that, you know, what can I share today? And, you know, you come up with different things every day. But again, it can be something really, really simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't even need to include technology. It might include technology. And that's great. And, you know, as you've said, we now have, technology has given us this capacity and this ability to be able to connect with strangers, you know, on a scale previously we could never have imagined. And so, you know, that is one way that we can connect and share with people. Um, and and there's, there are lots of, you know, phenomenal aspects of that. You know, there are all kinds of schemes. There's an organization called Incredible Edible. And what they do is they go and they plant um, food in public areas for everyone to share. So oh, yes. You might have a pothole in the street. You might have a, you know, a, a kind of bit of, you know, public garden that's not being used or just an area that's completely sort of derelict. And actually people just go and they, it's kind of guerrilla gardening and they'll go and they'll plant and actually, you know, in the process of doing that, of volunteering your time to do that and of growing something is really empowering. But then there's all this food for people to share they can happen upon. Um, so I, I, you know, there's organizations like Street Bank, um, for example, where you can, you know, you can connect and share with, you know, with people in your street. Um, there, are, there are examples everywhere in the world if you, you know, if you look for them. They're, they're there, but again, you, it doesn't have to be about technology. It could really be something as simple as a smile. And I love that you mentioned smiling because Thailand's known as the, the land of a thousand smiles. And the way it affected my happiness, just seeing strangers say hello to me and smile whilst walking down the street is, I can't even begin to describe what a big difference it makes to your, to your day. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I mentioned um, we have this extraordinary woman called Natasha Wood, who is, um, you know, she's a disabled woman. Uh, she challenges stereotypes by through sharing laughter. That's what she does. And she she is absolutely extraordinary. She's been on the Generation Share tour with us. We've been touring. We've been um, we've done 21 launches. We've been to Paris. Barcelona, Amsterdam, we've been in Lisbon, um, next week we're in Cardiff, we've been all over, all over, all over the UK, we've been up in Scotland, um, we've been literally all over the UK, um, we were in Nottingham in Natasha's hometown, sharing some laughter there, um, we're next, we're going to, following Cardiff, we're going to be in the US, we're going to New York, San Francisco, but the idea ultimately, I'm going to India in November, um, it's my father's 80th birthday. His dream has been to go to India. And so um, we are going to India. I'm going back to India and we're going to be, um, we're going to be launching the book in Mumbai. Um, but essentially the idea is to, is to take this book wherever we can. And, you know, one thing that everybody can do is, is buy this book, Generation Share. It's every, every single book educates a girl in the slums in Mumbai and plants a tree. So they're sharing through the book. It's made from waste materials. It's with a nonprofit publisher, Policy Press, who published books about social change. And so, you know, that's something that everybody can do. It's available online just about everywhere. You can find it via the Policy Press website. It's on Amazon, of course. It's, it's pretty much in all good bookstores. We've been launching in Waterstones and independent bookstores. It's everywhere. 
And so, you know, there are so many different ways that people can share the positivity. And I guess that's my big message, you know, share the hope, share the positivity. That's something that we can all do. It's absolutely out there because that's how we're going to change the world, you know, one share at a time. Thank you so much, Benita. And of course, all your links will be underneath, including the one to the book as well, so that everyone can, can be encouraged as much as I have been by this conversation. Thank you for sharing your time. It's been lovely to chat. Thank you to you. And thanks for sharing. You know, this is a pan-generational, pan-geographical, pan-economic, pan-gender group. They demonstrate explicitly that sharing knows no boundaries. Generation share, rather than a demographic, is a mindset, a lifestyle that we can choose to adopt. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the podcast and feel as encouraged as I did with my conversation with Benita. It was really wonderful and all the links are below so that you can do some more research of your own and also the links to some of the companies I mentioned such as Trusted House Sitters, Zipcar uh, and some others. They are really, really useful services that can save you a bunch of money but also, as was mentioned in the conversation, have a real changing effect for the society we live in and for the future. So, if you enjoyed that episode, check out some of the others. I mentioned the one with Kelly Kemp, the one with Emma Jackson, the one with Jonathan McDonald, Eleanor Snare. They're all wonderful, and if you enjoyed the subject, you should enjoy those too. Uh, And they've got so many pointers in all those episodes that we can really use to our advantage. Give us a like, give us a follow, give us a recommendation. That always helps, and catch you soon. This is a pan-generational, pan-geographical, pan-economic, pan-gender group. They demonstrate explicitly that sharing knows no boundaries. Generation share rather than a demographic is a mindset, a lifestyle that we can choose to adopt.